Greetings, the Astro 30 here yet again and welcome back to AEL. Now, today we're going to be looking at how we can calculate the output impedance of an amplifier. Now, this is only really relevant if you want to know, say in the case of a power amplifier, what its uh, damping factor is. And I'll go a little bit into what damping factor is a little later in the video, but first, the way we can figure out what the output impedance of a typical power amplifier, such as this one, this is the Elector PA300 I made, um, is to measure it. And what we need to know is we need to know what the unloaded voltage output of the amplifier is versus once it's loaded. I'll do a demonstration shortly. I'll use the breadboard version of the um, building an amplifier from scratch on the breadboard next to me as the test unit. But first let's have a look at the calculation. So the output impedance of the amplifier, which is Z out, is going to equal our resistive load or the speaker load multiplied by the voltage of the amplifier unloaded, VU, minus the voltage of the amplifier loaded, VL, divided by the voltage of the amplifier loaded. So we would calculate this part of the equation first and then just do the complete multiplication and division in one uh, foul swoop. Uh, unless you've got a scientific calculator and you can actually enter brackets and stuff like that into the uh, input, uh, it makes it a lot easier. Otherwise you're going to have to do separate two separate operations. There is another way to calculate it, but it requires two mathematical operations, which is Z out equals voltage unloaded minus voltage loaded divided by the current loaded. So the current loaded is calculated from the voltage loaded divided by the resistive load. So in order to do this test, we're obviously going to need a power amplifier to test. We're also going to need either an oscilloscope or just a normal multimeter set to the AC voltage scale to measure out what the voltage at the amplifier is when it's loaded and unloaded, plus a function generator. Now, you could get away with a online tone generator, pumping it into the input of the amp to do the test if you don't have a function generator. I'm going to do the measurement with both a multimeter and an oscilloscope. You're also going to need to have a known load resistance such as an 8 ohm dummy load which I've got there which is just two 4 ohm resistors in series or you could use a speaker but you would want to keep the volume low. Now I've got the multimeter directly hooked to the output of the amplifier and that's where you want to do both your unloaded and your loaded tests is measuring directly at the output terminals not at the load, just keep that in mind. I've got my oscillator set to roughly 100 hertz, well actually 100 hertz, and I'm going to wind the oscillator up and I'm going to get it so that we're at roughly 3 volt RMS, which is exactly what this meter is saying, if I can get it precise. It doesn't have to be perfect, that'll do. So we'll say 3.058 volts, so we write that figure down. And then we take our output of our amplifier and we load it into the load. If I can get it on there, it'd be nice. There we go. And then we take note of the voltage drop, which is currently 3.047. Because if we measure directly at the load, it will drop more significantly. Because what we want to be taking into account is the length of the leads back to the load because that is a real world scenario that it's the speaker and the speaker leads itself which will affect the output impedance of the amplifier. We don't care about how much voltage drop is at the speakers, in other words, we're only interested in how much voltage drop is at the output of the amplifier. So now I'll unload it without shorting anything and it's come back up to its initial voltage of 3.058. So now we'll use an oscilloscope to do the same thing uh, it's a little bit higher on the oscilloscope, it could be the way that it mathematically works it out. But um, it's 3.21 volt in this case, unloaded. So we will now load the amplifier output and take note of our voltage drop. 3.19 I'm going to say. So now we're ready to calculate what the output impedance is. 
and we can use either of these two equations and get the same answer. However, we have to do a second operation to work out the current. But, I will just prove that we'll get the same result with both of these calculations. Now, I could use either the multimeter output voltages or the oscilloscope ones, it doesn't really matter. But for this, we need to know what our load resistance was. In this case, I was using 8. So it's going to be 8 multiplied by the voltage unloaded, which is 3.058 minus 3. Point, that's wrong, 3.047, close bracket, divided by, well, 3.047. And that gives us a grand total of around 28 millirohms. And just for completeness, we'll use the oscilloscope values next. So that's 8 multiplied by 3.21 minus 3.19, close bracket, divided by 3.19. Well, it's more like 50 millirohms. So you can just take an average in between the two, I guess. But there's a difference of around about 23 millirohms. Not that it really matters for this low of a uh, impedance, but gives you a general idea. It's not going to be 100% accurate because you're going on, you know, the resistance of your coax cable of your uh, oscilloscope probe, as well as if you're using a multimeter, the multimeter probes themselves. So just keep that in mind, but it's a, it's a good base figure. So I'm going to try the second equation, but that requires me to calculate what the current of the load is, which is just basic Ohm's law, but it requires a second mathematical calculation. So I'm going to use the multimeter values for this. So the voltage loaded was 3.047 divided by the resistive load, which is 8, gives us a current of 0.38. So we'll make that 0.381. So now that we know the current, we can plug in the values of uh, the unloaded, which is 3.058 minus 3.047 loaded. Now divided by the current, which is 0.381, and there's a 28 millirohm roughly output impedance, which is exactly what the first equation showed. So. I could do the oscilloscope values to get the same result of 50 millirohms, but what's the point? Right, so now we know what the output impedance is roughly of the amplifier. Well, this is not very useful. Well, what can we do with this figure? Well, we could use it to work out what the optimal load we can put on the amplifier to get the most output out of it. However, in reality, we wouldn't be able to put anything lower on a simple amplifier like that more than 4 ohms. So we couldn't put like 28 millirohms on it, it'd be nice, but you'd probably blow the amplifier up. However, we can use that figure to calculate the next thing of an amplifier, which is known as damping factor. What is damping factor? Well, it's the ratio of output impedance of the amplifier to the input impedance of the speaker. But it's also the ability of the amplifier to control cone movement of the speaker. That is, when we get a bass transient, for instance, and the cone pushes out, and then the transient disappears on the amplifier, well the cone itself, depending on its suspension, can then continue to oscillate naturally by itself to a complete rest. So damping factor is the ability of the amplifier to stop the cone from doing that. So as soon as the transient is gone, the speaker stops oscillating by itself, basically. So that is the most simplest calculation. It's basically the load impedance, which is 8 ohms in this case, divided by our output impedance. So damping factor DF equals R loaded divided by Z out. And that's as basic as that gets. But we had to do that other stuff in between to get the output impedance. So yeah, it, if you really want to know what the output impedance of the amplifier is and its damping factor, you have to go through this. So let's calculate that out. So I'm going to use both impedances for the output that we uh, calculated. I'll start with the 28 millirohm. So that's going to be 8 divided by 0 0.028. And that gives us a damping factor of 285. Now a damping factor over 
10 is considered okay. Uh, and anywhere between 100 and 200 damping factor is considered very, very good. Any higher than that, and it's excellent. What that will also result in is much tighter bass response. Uh, if the damping factor is too low of the amplifier, well, the bass is going to sound lacking, muddy, uh, just not as punchy as it should. So damping factor in an amplifier is kind of important for how it controls the bass, basically. So let's use the 50 millivolt um, worst case scenario output impedance. So that's, uh, what are we? 8 divided by 0 0.050. Well, the damping factor is more like 160. And that's the reason why I measured the output impedance at 100 hertz, because that is a bass frequency. Above a kilohertz damping factor doesn't really matter because, well, the speakers don't have that much movement at that frequency. It's only the bass frequencies that we're interested in controlling, so you can use 100 hertz, 200 hertz, and a good idea would be to actually measure it at different frequencies as well, say 10 hertz, 20 hertz, 50 hertz, 100 hertz, 200 hertz, uh, to around about 360. Yep, and then do the calculations. And then we'll take an average of what the damping factor is. But that's it. That's basically how we calculate the output impedance of an amplifier and its damping factor. And I hope someone found this video interesting and useful. I'm the Astro 30, and if you enjoyed this video, please remember to go down below, like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And as always, this is the Astro 30 saying, see ya. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.